go. All righty. First thing we want to talk about this morning is how the University of St. Thomas is going to communicate with your sons and daughters um, when they are here um, at the university. Um, our, ex the, our primary means of communicating with your sons and daughters is going to be via uh, their St. Thomas email account. Um, we, um, it is very, very difficult um, for us to program and send stuff to their Yahoo account or their Gmail or Hotmail or whatever. Um, so their UST email account will be the primary means of communication to them. Um, the, the, the paper that we've been sending home, the admissions office has been sending um, up to this point um, will also end. So everything that gets communicated to your sons and daughters is um, via St. Thomas email. Um, we obviously encourage students to be checking um, their email on a regular basis. Um, the financial aid office, um, I know some of the other offices send out quite a bit of email um, to students. Um, it's usually we usually send out emails in mass. In other words, we send them out to like virtually every undergraduate student, and yet we have managed to personalize those emails. So it looks like I've written the email exclusively, exclusively to your son or daughter. Um, they can always reply to us, and the reply does actually come back to us as individuals, so we will uh, reply to students, obviously, if they have questions. But you should be aware of that, that we do send quite a few emails and they are quite important. Um, I, I, don't, I always like to tell my parents when I'm meeting with them that I'm not going to be sending your sons and daughters emails asking them how their classes are going or do they like the food or how was the game last Saturday. Those are not the kind of emails that they're going to get from us. Um, they're going to get emails directing them to take action or, or, or just informational. Have your sons and daughters understand that if they don't get what we're trying to get to with them, at the very least, forward it on to you so that you can call our respective offices, um, and we'll be more than happy to, to help you out. Um, if there is something that has to get sent out um, in paper format, it's going to go to the permanent or home, home address that we have on file. Um, that information is always uh, confirmable and updatable by your sons or daughters via Murphy Online. So um, it's always a good thing to go out there and check. Um, sometimes students forget to, if there's a, an apartment number or a, a building number that uh, sometimes uh, gets neglected off those addresses, is a good time to go out there and update that information. Um, the un university also has what we refer to as the newsroom, which is a web-based um, publication that gets updated three times a week um, by our university um, and con constituent relations. Um, lots of good information in there, and again, a lot, that's a really good way for us to communicate with students. And of course, students also have an actual campus mailbox. It's located in the basement of the Murray Herrick building. Um, so if you want to send them uh, pa care packages, letters, uh, that kind of thing, they actually do have a on-campus mailbox. Um, we are just wanted to kind of demonstrate that we do have the ability for you and your sons and daughters to go out and actually estimate um, what the bill is going to look like. Um, Bill's going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes, but you have the ability to actually go out at, ahead of time and plug in um, different factors in terms of the amount of tuition costs, and, uh, number of credits you're taking on a per semester basis, um, whether or not your son or daughters are taking any business classes. Um, music lesson fees get, can get added in. Um, they can also choose which residence hall they're going <clears> to <throat> excuse me, which residence hall they're going to live in. Um, meal plans, any other expenses, books, supplies, uh, health insurance, and then you can also then go in and subtract out the, the financial aid that your son or, sons or daughters are receiving. And it's a wonderful tool for you to estimate exactly what it is you're going to need to cover the remainder of their costs for the school year. Bill's going to go into the, the, how we do our billing in a moment, so we won't delve into that right at this moment. But this is a very useful tool for you um, to go out and uh, look at those different, uh, those different features. And the link is right. You can get to that right from the St. Thomas Financial Aid webpage. Um, obviously, your sons and daughters are also uh, 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 encouraged to meet with us as financial aid counselors. You may recall that uh, they've all been assigned a financial aid counselor within our office, and we obviously highly encourage students, if they have questions, to give us a call, send us an email, and they certainly are welcome to come in um, and talk about uh, their situations. Um, and we are happy to help them out as best we possibly can. Um, if you have, uh, if you're planning on using other educational funding sources, uh, like for example, if you have 529 or Cloverdale um, accounts, and you're going to be using those to pay, um, remember that it's the owner of the account um, that initiates the request with the plan administrator. In other words, 
whoever owns that account, be it you or if it's a grandparent or if it's, the account is actually in your son's or daughter's names, it's their responsibility to um, contact who's ever running that account um, to initiate the disbursement of the funds here to the school. So we don't have anything to do with that. Um, that really relies entirely upon the owner um, of those kinds of, um, uh, of, of those accounts. Um, the e-bills, and again, uh, Bill will be talking about that in a minute, um, those will become available um, later on in August, and so at that point you'll have a good idea of what it is that you need. And my understanding is that that usually gives you plenty of time to get those funds set up for disbursement here to the school. Um, if you're going to be doing things like home equity, um, you may, um, or you have other personal lines of accounts that you're going to be uh, utilizing, this is a good time to maybe go back and review the details of those um, so that you're familiar and ready to go once the billing statements go out. Students who are receiving outside scholarships um, from various outside organizations or from their high schools, local community groups, that type of thing, um, Remember that those, those students, if they're getting a paper check, um, they should be bringing those to the financial aid office. Um, a, a lot of the time, those kinds of checks are made co-payable to the student and to the university. So when your sons or daughters are dropping those checks off in our office, it's important that they endorse the check um, so that we can move forward with processing it. Otherwise, if they just drop it off or they send it to us in the mail, then we simply have to have them come to our office anyway. We'll send them a note. Um, via email, um, asking them to come to our office, and then they all have to come and sign that. So that sometimes slows things down a little bit. So if they can endorse the check, uh, if it's made co-payable, um, they should do that ahead of time. There are some other financing options. Um, uh, beyond uh, the scholarships, uh, for those of you that are going to be uh, utilizing the parent, the Federal Parent PLUS Loan Program, um, the interest rate on that program for the coming school year um, is a fixed 7.21%. The PLUS program also charges an origination fee of a little bit over 4%, 4.288. Um, so if you're borrowing from that program, remember you're going to want to add in those fees because when the fee, if you ask for $25,000, for example, um, they're going to subtract out the 4% fees from that and the net disbursement will be um, somewhat less, a little bit about uh, uh, a little bit less than the 25,000, obviously. So you're going to want to make sure you're taking that into account. Uh, the application for the PLUS loan program is actually done through our office. We have a paper application um, that's completed, um, has to be signed and, and returned to us. We do not need um, a, a, a paper document with your wet signature on it, which basically means it's, perp it's acceptable to fax it to us or scan it and email it. Really, however you want to get it to us um, is perfectly acceptable. Um, there are also other uh, financing options. Uh, there, uh, there's a large number of different private education loan programs that are out, um, out there for your sons and daughters to borrow from. Most of those programs, huh, I shouldn't say most, all of those programs require that they have a creditworthy cosigner um, to utilize those kinds of, uh, use those kinds of borrowing mechanisms, but there's a lot of choices out there. And right now they're offering still some pretty competitive interest rates. So if you are thinking about utilizing a private loan program, this would be a good time to be reviewing, um, reviewing those options. Again, on the St. Thomas Financial Aid website, we provide a link that takes students out to um, a, a third party service server that actually provides a listing, a partial listing of the loans that are available for students. It's important to remember that um, when you're looking at this list, it is not an exhaustive list um, for you to borrow from. In other words, you can, if you have an, a relationship with a, a credit union or some other banking institution that does uh, private education loans and you want to use them instead of who's ever on this list, you're perfectly fine doing that. We will, um, we will uh, certify um, and accept loan funds from, from any source. So, but this is a nice tool because it gives you the ability to look at some different lenders um, and compare their rates and repayment terms and, and that kind of thing and really uh, help you and your uh, sons and daughters make a good choice in terms of uh, uh, those extra uh, private loan options. You're certainly welcome to contact our office if you would like some general guidance with this. Um, we unfortunately are never allowed to specifically endorse one loan product over the next. So um, don't call me going, Scott, which one of these lenders should I choose? Because my response is going to be, it's kind of up to you. Um, you get to choose whoever you want. So, but there's a lot of good programs out there, so don't be afraid to take advantage of those if that's something you're thinking about doing. 
Um, you know, just a couple of things to remember. If your sons or daughters have done the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, they were offered some level of, of, st of federal student loan funding. We always encourage students to be using those loan funds first. Those are guaranteed loans. They do not require a cosigner. They offer the most, most flexible repayment terms later on. Um, those are the ones that students always want to start with if they are going to be borrowing to cover some of their costs. Um, Remember, you always want to kind of look at everything on a full year basis. Um, you, you, remember, you do the FAFSA each year, and you're going to want to look at your costs one year at a time and really get a good handle on what those costs are going to be. If you're doing um, a, a parent loan, again, those do not require a great deal of time to process, usually just a couple of days. Private education loans, on the other hand, can take anywhere from three to four weeks to process. So that's something to keep in mind if you're going to be borrowing from those programs. We are, believe it or not, in the last week of July already. Um, so if you are thinking about a private loan program and haven't gotten started with it yet, this would be a good time um, to, to, to get that going. Uh, student employment here at St. Thomas. Um, all of our students are, all of our undergraduate students are eligible to work on campus. We do not restrict working on campus to uh, students who have a need-based allowance. In other words, even if you, your son or daughter did not complete the FAFSA, or if they did but were not awarded a St. Thomas work-study allowance or a federal work-study allowance, they can still work on campus. Um, our Human Resources uh, Office um, uh, actually posts all of the different job listings, and you can see the link um, there down toward the, toward the bottom of the page next to Tommy's fist there. Um, working on campus um, is, there's a lot of flexibility. I encourage students to do it, obviously, if, if they have the time to do it and do so. A question came up before about athletics and, and, and academics. Um, I work with a lot of students who are, are good athletes, good students, and they find the time to work on campus eight to 10 hours a week. So it is entirely possible um, for your sons and daughters to be able to do that. I encourage students to uh, not get keyed in on one specific job that's at, that's at one specific time um, of the day um, because oftentimes there's a lot of other students who want that exact same uh, thing. I encourage students to think about this whole process and be very flexible in it, keeping in mind that your son or daughters can have more than one job on campus. They can have two or three jobs that add up to the right number of hours per week. Um, there's not a restriction that they only have one job on campus, so something to keep in mind. I think this is you, Bill. That'd be me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Peterson. You hear me okay? Okay. Sorry about that. Hey, I'll try to keep this brief, um, even though I know this is probably the most exciting information you're going to get all day. Um, and I'll keep it brief so we can have some questions afterwards if I need so. Um, I'm from the business office, we're going to discuss how we do the billing here at St. Thomas um, when we send the statements out. Talk a little bit about our payment plan, uh, authorized users, um, and a little bit about sending up an e-refund profile. Uh, first of all, as it's been mentioned a few times this morning, our main mode of communication is through the UST email. So we're going to be sending out right around the 22nd or 23rd of each month uh, an e-bill statement. Uh, with the following, following month, there's a due date on the 19th. Um, it's going to be like I said, just an e-bill, just saying a bill is ready to be viewed. It's not going to basically have the invoice on there with a the balance to pay, et cetera. You have to actually log in to do that. It's going to be sent out to the UST email to the student. The student is a, it's a student account, um, and plus they are 18 years of old, so they are adults. So it's going to be sent to them. We understand, obviously, as a parent, you're going to probably have a higher responsibility in paying this, so we do understand that. but Obviously, with the federal privacy laws, we do need to make sure that they set you up as an authorized user. By setting you up as an authorized user, it gives you access to, to build, uh, view the billing statements, make payments, and most importantly, if you have any questions and you want to talk about it with us, we can discuss that with you. We can dis discuss detailed information. Um, what the student's going to do is they're going to basically log into Murphy Online. Murphy Online is basically their main portal to do everything here. So they're going to be very familiar with that. They'll click into Murphy Online and then the e-bill, e-pay system. And you'll see basically this main page here gives you the access to make a payment, view account activity. Uh, there's also at the top of the screen, there's some information up there that I wanted to kind of highlight. There's the e-bill. 
that if you want to see the actual monthly statement with detailed charges from the, from the previous month or for that month, et cetera, you want to click on that. That's the actual statement. It's a PDF snapshot. So it shows you that information. Has a due date, account balance, minimum payment, or if there's a past due payment on there, it's going to show that. Um, what they're going to do, though, is click on, they, you want to do that, so that's important information. There's also e-refunds, which I'll discuss a little bit later, but I wanted to kind of highlight that. And then, obviously, authorized users. There's a click on it. They're going to click on authorized user to set you up. Basically, it's going to ask them to add you as an email, add an email address, click submit, done. Now, I, I know a lot of times they complain it's, it's hard, it's difficult, takes time. If they can set up their privacy status on Facebook, they can do this. Um, and I, I would just mention that they, they answer yes for both questions below that, because um, that allows you the ability to view the account activity, view payment history, billing statements, et cetera. If they click no, yes, you are an authorized user, we can discuss with you information about the account but you're not seeing the e-bill, you're not being able to view anything, so it kind of defeats the purpose. So, but basically, it's that simple. Uh, oops. And like I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's that e-bill tab. You can see, basically, an invoice or a statement very similar to this. And so for August, right around August 22nd or 23rd of this upcoming month, we're gonna send out the bills for fall semester. You're gonna see the detailed charges for fall, for room and board, tuition fees. And then right below that, you'll see current payments. Now that's basically any UST scholarship, any, any grant you may have. Uh, if there's um, any payments you may put forward on there, it's gonna show there it's current payments. But below that, it's gonna show pending financial aid. Now if the student has, that's basically any federal loan, private loan you may have set up. Now, if the student, we want to make sure if the student has been offered their aid, they're going to have to go in and accept their financial aid. And if they've done all the requirements that's needed for their federal loans, it's going to show pending. That's not going to apply until about the 17th or 18th of September. The reason we wait on that and show it as pending financial aid is we want to preserve basically the interest from starting until the very last second type of thing. So, um, but it's nice to be able to see that. You can be, easily look at what the total balance is, what pending aid is going to be coming out. You can subtract that off. And if you want, you can just pay the balance in full by that first due date, no problem. If you want to pay half, you can pay half, you know, and pay the other half the next month, wherever you want to do. But there's also a um, recommended payment plan that the students, can, or students or parents can follow for fall semester, September 19th through December 19th. Um, there's basically four equal installments due. So if you have a balance of 8,000, we're gonna divide that by four. After all the financial aids assessed, we're gonna divide it by four, so you have $2,000 payment each month. Um, for spring semester, a similar situation. Now for January term, for J term, that's gonna be billed out at the end of December, right around 22nd or 23rd, with that due in full on January 19th. Um, I would just recommend that your students communicate with you if they want to take a J term class. Discuss that with financial aid ahead of time so they know that they can incorporate those costs into the into the year. So a lot of times it's that's not communicated, and that could be an extra forty five hundred dollars that you're not expecting. Um, you know, come come January, February. So um, if you decide, like I mentioned, you can pay in full but you can follow the recommended payment plan. If you decide to pay that over the semester, there's a 1.1% finance charge assessed monthly, and that's basically the cost for extending the credit. Now, you can look at that and say, hey, nah, not a big deal, I can pay that over four months, and you may, you know, the 1.1% may be fine, but there could be other options for you if you wanted to, if it's just about managing cash flow and you think, well, maybe there's that two or 3% variable interest out there, you could look at maybe a private loan and manage your cash flow there, pay that over the year instead of with St. Thomas. It's completely up to you. Like I said, we have a recommended payment plan you can follow, but if you want to go the route of a better interest, that's fine. I'll, I'll look at, I'll mention that here right there. You know, you're like, look, 13.2 over the year? Oh, that's not very good. Well, yes, it's not, but it's a short-term extension of credit. So um, it's just an option for you to do that through St. Thomas. 
Um, like I mentioned before, if the student is owed any money back, meaning if they had just if they had more than enough financial aid to cover their balance for the semester, or if they maybe dropped a class and went from 16 down to 12 credits and we owe money back, we want to make sure we get the money back to you right away. So we want to make sure they set up an e-refund profile. Now the student has to set this up. As an authorized user, you're not able to do that from where you log into that app. That's not an option for you. The student will have to do that. Now, I understand as a parent, you, you may say, hey, I'm paying the bill, I wanna make sure I get the money. Well, okay, you just let your son or daughter know that they can put in whatever account you would want on there. Um, so we'll do that. So that's done usually generally with, within days. After a ref refund is generated, we're gonna generate that within I'd say three days to a week to get that taken care of. We still do cut paper checks, but it takes time. Uh, cost, cost saving measure plus we have to cut checks, get it over to accounts received or accounts payable to generate the checks that is, send it out in the mail. So it could take weeks to do that. So if you wanna get the money back sooner, then I would just suggest that they do set that up. Now in some cases you do use a parent plus loan and that actually generates a credit balance then we do ch cut the checks and send that to the actual borrower for that particular loan. Uh, forms of payment, obviously we do accept cash. In office, I would suggest not sending large sums of payment and large sums of cash in the, in the mail. Um, we do accept personal checks as well. And there's that online option. You can do an e-payment, which is basically using your checking account. It's called electronic check. It's routing number and account number. That is free of charge to use. Nice thing about it is also shows on the account, the student account immediately. It acts just like any other check. It's gonna take a couple days to hit your bank account, but the nice thing is if a student has a hold on their account or they need to register, you can make that payment and it will, it will show immediately on his account. So we could lift the hold. Um, there is a credit card option. We accept all major credit cards. Now, as you can see though, there is a 2.75% convenience fee for using that. We do not as apply credit card payments here at St. Thomas. We have a third party processor. So that's their fee for providing that service. Um, I don't recommend parents or families use that on a, a monthly basis. I just, we kind of mention that as maybe a cash flow issue. If, if you're only paid once a month, uh, if your, your receivables are a little slow, you're just waiting on payments if you're self-employed, that type of thing, maybe credit card is a good option for you to use. Um, but like I said, yeah, with that fee, it may not be the best thing to use on a month-on-month -month basis for your account. So like I said, the e-payment's probably the best option. Um, student payment agreement form, all students are gonna sign this today. They're gonna have to sign that prior to, being, prior to registering for class. Um, if they're over 18 years of old, only them have to sign that. If they're under 18, you as a parent, one parent will have to sign. I just want to point out it does not hold you responsible for anything. You're not a co-signer. It's just if they're under 18, we'll need an adult for that. Excuse me. Um, what this form does basically do documents the student's rights and responsibilities as a borrower and also for St. Thomas as well, our rights and responsibility in generating that credit we have to do that. Um, it explains how we extend the credit, talks about the payment plan, um, talks about the finance charges uh, and how that all works and ties in. So that's just something the students are gonna sign here today. Um, now, important, important to point out here that obviously if there's any issues on the account, we know both life happens. Um, let's say if you miss a payment on the 19th, we generate the next bill. It's going to put a hold on their registry, put a hold on their account for registering, um, and also accessing their transcript. Now, it could just be that you missed a payment, you make the payment, that hold will be lifted. But the reason we do that is if there is any issues, we can understand there can be an unexpected medical bill, car car bill, lost employment, whatever it may be. Please let us know. We're here to help you out. We just want to avoid the student from adding further charges, registering for further charges um, before we tackle. We wanna basically tackle the problem first before we add any further charges to the account. Um, it also, in some cases, I'm gonna discuss this a little bit, but the student also gets their ID card 
and they have that, and it has basically a stored function on it uh, with their meal plans, laundry, accessing the athletic facility, it asked to, and, and their dorms. Basically, it's their, their lifeline in a way here. But they also have the option of adding express cards to their account, express dollars, which can be used everywhere on campus for food, for books, for sweatshirts, Tommy shop, whatever it may be. There's also some off-campus facilities like Chipotle, Devani's, um, local grocery store down the street that they can use it there as well. And it's just kind of like a prepaid debit card. They could add funds to the account. But if they had a past due balance on their account, it could restrict them from adding it to it or billing it to their account. Um, uh, and like I'd mentioned here a little bit, there's an online system called Seaboard here that the student can access to do that or their parents can. Um, and it's available 24 seven. If you add, if you prepay it to their, their debit card, their, your ID card, it's, there's a 5% bonus you'd receive. So if you put on every, for every $100 you put on, you receive a 5% bonus. So you could receive a $105. So it's just an option to use um, on top of, you know, what is available on that card as well for, because their meal plans are on that. But this is express dollars that they can use everywhere if they wanted to. Like I said, you don't have to use it. I will talk about that later on this afternoon actually, but I just kind of want to bring that up. But like I said, if there's any issues, you can call me. My information's up here. Um, or Dan Gallivan, uh, he's assistant director. So if there's any issues, we're here for you. We want to know you, we can work with you in any way or form as much as we can. So um, beyond that though, this is basically kind of the nuts and bolts on how we handle the bill in here. Is there any questions you folks may have for either Scott or I? Ma'am? Um, yeah, the question was in regards to the payment plan and, and making the payments each month. You could make the four equal installments if you want to. You still do get a finance charge. That's assessed off the total balance. So if you make that minimum payment, there's still a finance charge assessed off of whatever balance is remaining after that. Yeah. Otherwise, like you said, if you want to pay up in full by that first due date, that's great. It's completely up to you and how do you want to do that. So yeah. Yeah, students, when students get a job on campus, the question was, uh, my son or daughter has work-study earnings, the bill is paid, what happens to those work-study earnings, basically? Um, students, actually, when students get a job on campus, they have the, op they, will, they will basically decide at the point they get their job, do I want the monies to come to me in the form of a paycheck? The university runs payroll every two weeks, and the, your son or daughter can have their, they can just simply have their work study earnings deposited into their own checking or savings account, just like Bill and I do, and that's their money to spend. So that's one way that they can get paid, or uh, they, can, they can tell payroll, hey, you know what, uh, my folks have got me responsible for part of my tuition bill for the, for the semester, so when, the, when payroll runs every two weeks, instead of giving me the money, because I'm just gonna go do something silly with it, like go to a movie or whatever, um, I want that money applied against my tuition bill. So every two weeks when payroll runs, that will show up as a payment, so to speak, on their, on their tuition account. The, the, the reality is that your sons and daughters can actually choose a, a combination of those two things. They can say, hey, I want half of it to come to me as a paycheck and the other half to go against my tuition bill. I think they get to do that in 25% increments. So they can say a quarter and 75% gets goes one way or half and half or, or that way. So they do have some choices there. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Good. Ma'am? Good question. Um, so the son or daughter, the, the, the question was, uh, we don't want to take the loans out right away. Uh, my son or daughter has enough money to pay the remaining balance for fall, but then we want them to borrow and pay for spring um, and use those funds for the spring. The student can, um, they, so if, and if they've declined their loan already, um, that's entirely fine. The student can notify us or contact our office. 
we usually ask them for something in writing saying, um, I've changed my mind, I want to accept my loan. They can do that sometime in you know, the latter part of December um, or even before the spring semester starts, and then we would simply reprocess and reoriginate the loan at that point. So that's entirely possible for them. If they haven't accepted their loans yet, um, and they're not going to, they want to use your savings first and then use the loans for spring, you can go ahead and do that. For the full amount. For the full amount, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. One more question. Yes, yes, sir. If you received a St. Thomas grant, I think we assume that you want that or you have to accept that. Uh, good question. The, the question is if your son or daughters are recipients of St. Thomas scholarship, St. Thomas Grant, um, a federal Pell Grant, or like a Minnesota State Grant. We assume that students want those grants and they do not have to indicate to us that they want to decline um, those. So th those are, we assume that students want the free money. Um, I, I, I went around and around with a student a few years ago who was just in, very, very intent on declining his Minnesota State Grant and I'm, I had to explain it to him, no, this is free money. And, and so yeah, he finally got it. So. Great. Um, I think we're done, and Sister is going to uh, uh, introduce the next. If there's any further uh, questions, we're speakers. available out there, or else during our fair as well. So, yeah, we'll be thank you.